Hi everyone, Michael Shermer. Time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show. This one is sponsored by another podcast. This podcast is called Everything, Everywhere, Daily. This is one of my favorite new podcasts I've been listening to the last few weeks. Gary Arnett posts these short, like 10, 12, 14, 15, 16 minute um, uh, clips on different topics, an incredible variety of topics. Uh, so, and he posts them every single day. And so just scrolling down month by month, you can go through, um, lots of different, uh, subjects that uh, I've, most of them, I've never even given any thought to. So it's a great way to, to kind of break out of whatever it is you're normally thinking about as Gary posts these every day. Like here's one, a history of the American flag. I know nothing about this. The Taj Mahal, the rarest feats in sports. Uh, Canada Day. Yeah, what's with Canada Day? Okay. Uh, the origin of words and phrases in Shakespeare's writings. Whoa. Yeah. The last man on the moon. Who was the last man on the moon? Everybody knows that Neil Armstrong was the first and Buzz Aldrin the second. But who was the last? Okay, we're going to find out if you listen to that. And so on and so forth. Okay, so Gary uh, is an interesting figure himself. He sold his business, then he sold his house, then he started traveling around the world. He's been everywhere. And this piqued his interest to take a look at different topics like these I've just mentioned. And so I appreciate his support of the podcast. I want to promote his podcast because I love listening to it. And podcasts are really the new way to go for audio content while you're doing whatever you're doing. In my case, driving, doing chores, riding my bike, walking the dog. Uh, I pretty much just have the earbuds in, just constantly listening to stuff. And Gary's Everything Everywhere Daily is now on my regular podcast catcher. I just use Spotify here to show you, but it's on all the different podcast platforms. So check it out. Everything Everywhere Daily. You won't be disappointed. Okay. Thanks for listening. Here's the episode. Just to remind you all, I'm the publisher of Skeptic Magazine, the day job here. This is the quarterly publication of the Skeptic Society. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. So if you want to support the podcast, support the magazine, support our work, go to skeptic.com slash donate, or just go to skeptic.com and click under magazine if you want to order the magazine uh, digitally, or uh, you can pick it up here at a local bookstore as well. We're all four color inside now. And uh, still one of those few magazines that hung in there through the uh, Great Recession, and they're still cruising along thanks to your support. All right, my guest today is Christopher Shabri. He's a professor at uh, Gut. Geisinger, I think I'm saying that right, of Pennsylvania Healthcare System, where he co-directs the Behavioral Insights team. He previously taught at Union College and Harvard University, and he's a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science. Chris received his PhD in psychology and AB in computer science from Harvard. His research focuses on decision-making, attention, intelligence, and behavior genetics. His work has been published in leading journals, including Science, Nature, PNA, PNAS, and Perception. And he's also published essays in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, the Washington Post. Chris is also a chess master, games enthusiast, and co-author of the best-selling book, The Invisible Gorilla, How Our Intuitions Deceive Us. As you know, Christopher is the co-author of that book and the new book that we're going to be talking about today. Here it is on the audio edition that I listened to it on, called Nobody's Fool, Why We Get Taken In and What We Can Do About It. It's a great read as so many of these audiobooks are now, uh, these days. So pick up that or the uh, or the hard hardcover edition as well. His co-author is Dan Simons, who uh, was un unable to make it today due to uh, family conflicts. Uh, uh, but uh, the, author, the book is by both of them. All right. Welcome, Christopher. Nice to see you. Thanks very much for having me. And it's, uh, it's a good listen as well as a good read. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the idea. I was just listening to the, I was just did a bike ride this morning. So I listened to the intro, the conclusion, and the last two chapters again, a couple hour bike ride uh, on uh, some of the more interesting things. Okay. The reason I love this topic, I just can't get enough of it. And I've done quite a few episodes on the subject of, you know, frauds and cons and this sort of thing is, um, is the, is the, the uh, implications for what these findings are about human nature, specifically to what extent are we naturally rational or irrational? Are we naturally gullible or are we naturally skeptical? And uh, so let's just start there. Kind of, you know, this, as you know, there's this larger debate in cognitive science on those very questions. And 
for decades, you know, people like Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky and others have pointed out how irrational we are and how stupid we are in decision making and so on and so forth. But there are pushback like Gerd Gingerinzer, who you cite in your book as well, uh, who says, well, not so fast, you know, under the right conditions, we can be reasonably rational and not so gullible. So how do you think about that bigger issue? Well, I, I think we're capable of rationality and capable of gullibility. It, there's not one universal nature that is in play all the time. Uh, certainly, people are capable of extremely rational sorts of behaviors. I don't know, I suppose mathematical, you know, inventing mathematical logic, mathematical proofs, those kinds of things are extremely rational and logical. And of course, also of applying normative economic concepts. Um, we are very good at thinking economically the way a rational person should think um, when we try. And I would say often when we don't try, but I am in the camp of, of those who agree that sometimes we are being irrational or let, in sort of the context of fraud and deception gullible uh, without realizing we're doing it. And I think that's the problem is that when we don't realize that that we are um, making suboptimal decisions systematically, not using the right information and so on, when we're not aware that we're doing that, or in fact, we're under the illusion that we are being completely rational and, and logical, then we can get into trouble. Uh, I, I don't have a, you know, I don't have any strong views about deep theories of rationality uh, and evolution, but I do feel pretty strongly that the problem is the mismatch between you know, how rational and, and logical and accurate we think we're being and what is in fact really going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's uh, talk about some spe specific examples. Um, like I, I had recently had um, a Kelly Pope on the show. She studies, she's a professor of accounting who studies financial fraud and um, her book is, it's another one of the fool books. Uh, sorry. It's not, nobody's fooled. That's your book. It was don't be fooled again or something like that. <laughs> There's so many plays on that. Uh, but, um, so I was telling her about the, uh, Tinder swindler on Netflix. I don't know if you saw uh, that, I, that. I have seen so, it. Yeah. So, you know, the setup is these sort of mid thirties women that are attractive, not married, looking for love, swipe right and go out on a date with this guy. And the guy's pictured with a private jet and, you know, he looks like he's a great catch, good looking guy and so forth. So of course I'm supposed they might be a little skeptical. I wonder if he really has a jet or what. So they go out on a date with him and he actually takes them on a jet. And they go to some, you know, like resort and five-star hotel and beautiful restaurant. And they have the romantic weekend and, and on and on. And this goes on for months until finally he's, you know, he's an international man of mystery. And uh, he disappears to Morocco or someplace in Europe and, and then, you know, calls her out of the blue and says, oh, my gosh, I got to close this deal on Monday. The bank's closed. And, you know, can you send me 10000 bucks or whatever it was? You know? So that's kind of the moment. Right. So, um, you know, I asked this Kelly Pope accounting uh, professor, you know, what do you make of that? She goes, well, would you just send me $10,000 if I asked you? And I said, well, no, of course I wouldn't. I don't even know you. <laughs> but, you know, if we were dating and I was in love with you and we were going to get married, we we're going to build a family, have kids, the whole thing. I might. I mean, if you know, I don't know if the, it's hard to say. I don't know what I'd fall for under all those conditions in the buildup. And, you know, so, again, are these women foolish? Are they gullible? Are they, uh, is this guy just so good that the average reasonably skeptical person would fall for something like that? Well, I would say on, on the one hand, there is an element of gullibility, but that's not the whole story. And what, what, what we like to say about gullibility is that it's involved in people being defrauded and deceived and conned, but there's no concept of gullibility which draws a bright line between people who could be victimized by things like you just described or many other complex cons or even simple frauds. There's no bright line between the people who could be victims and the people who couldn't. So I watched The Tinder Swindler, and it's, of course, one of you know many um, documents of romance scams and long cons and, and so on. And there's nothing obviously wrong with any of these people. Well, at least in that, uh, at least the main characters in, in that series, right? There, there could be certainly um, cognitive issues and, and so on that, that do make some people more vulnerable to being deceived, but not in, not in cases like these. Um, and yet uh, it, it does seem like they might, must have made a mistake somewhere along the line. Certainly they were given a lot of evidence that these guys were real um, and that he was wealthy and all of that. But of course, it was all largely a setup. Um, and that's that's what makes something a, a long con in a sense, right? Is that the, 
The con artist will go to great lengths over a long period of time to create such a convincing story, such convincing alibis, and so on, that when the ask finally comes um, for the payoff to, you know, to start happening for them after all this investment, um, or at least the financial payoff, there may have been other payoffs along the line, but the financial payoff, uh, it's completely convincing at that point, and it may take people much longer to realize what's going on than they would have if it had come sooner. Um, uh, is that irrational? I, I think, I, I think no. I think there's a lot of good reasons for, for those people to believe what's going on, and I don't, don't question their motives either. They were looking for something, and they thought they found it, and they thought they found what they were looking for. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. They weren't looking for anything that they shouldn't have been, or, you know, anything illegal or anything that they shouldn't have, have wanted. Um, I think, uh, you know, along the line, um, there are usually always things you can notice and interpret in different ways. And if you are sort of committed to the idea that this guy really is, a, you know, a multimillionaire international business guy with a jet and so on, you can start to not notice things that are inconsistent with that, forget about them perceive them in different ways. I mean, a, a, a very simple analogy um, is uh, we'll jump from romance scams to sports, right? So there's a there very nice video um, anybody can find on YouTube of uh, a trick play in football where the offense lines up um, in a, a normal formation and the defense is, is sort of standing there getting ready as well. And uh, this is American football. So the quarterback bends down, puts his uh, hands between the center's legs to receive the snap. And the center, instead of uh, handing it back between his legs to the quarterback, passes it around his body to the quarterback, who just takes the ball and sort of strolls forward, nonchalantly walks through the line, through the defense. And once he gets past the last defensive guy, he starts running for the end zone and scores a touchdown. And the defense is just standing there the whole time, staring at him, wondering what's going on. And, what, what they're doing is they're interpreting what they're seeing according to their expectations for what should be happening. Football plays don't start that way, so they weren't expecting the play to start that way. They have a certain expectation, a certain set of commitments or beliefs about um, what things mean in that environment. And the same thing with people who are swindled in these long cons. I think it's, it's expectations and commitments um, explain a lot of, of, how they, of how they go wrong. Uh, if there's if they didn't believe that one thing, they would see everything. They would see everything differently. But once they establish that initial belief, it sort of influences the perception of a, a lot of other things down the line. Yeah, you're talking in the book about uh, Hanny Youngman's famous quote um, compared to how, how's your wife compared to what? By the way, I've been using that right. line for a long time, but I've, because I've never written it down, I never bothered to actually look up who said it. And it tur yeah. turned out it wasn't Jack Benny like I'd been saying. It was Hanny Youngman. Oh, yeah, Hanny Youngman. In any case, yeah, compared to what? Yeah, so after this Tinder sw swindler, I got to thinking, well, they're not telling us how many women he tried this out on. What's the base rate? You know, of course, the show was the, the ones that got most conned. Maybe he did it on 100 women and, you know, 75 of them told him to fuck off and the others, you know, 15 others never fell for it. And just a couple that we see in the show are the ones that fell for it. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the main reasons, I think, why we misunderstand how scams and cons work is because we only see the films and the podcasts and the articles about a cons that originally started working, working well enough to con some people and then B were caught or the people realized they were being con. Maybe there were, there was no criminal charge in the end, but it's sort of the plot unraveled. And now we can, we can see the whole thing. And I don't think it's so much the problem that there are lots of ones that are going on and are not getting caught. I think there are lots of ones that are attempted, but never got off the ground. So the classic example of that, we, we sort of call this a selection principle, is the Nigerian email scam, which originally was a, a Nigerian postal mail scam and then the fax scam. And of course, now it's not really Nigerian anymore. In fact, it's more Nigerian because sometimes uh, the scammers will say they're Nigerian or they're from Nigeria or they're trying to recover a fortune that's in Nigeria or someplace else in West Africa. And the funny part about it is this thing's been going on for so many decades, and yet they still say, I'm so-and-so from Nigeria or Ivory Coast or something like that. Why do they say that if everybody knows there's a Nigerian scam and it's been going on for decades and so on? Well, the reason is they are filtering out 
anybody who is skeptical enough to know about the Nigerian scam, to wonder whether these people are really telling the truth and so on, they're basically making it easy for the targets to just delete the email or ignore it. And probably a lot of people with the Tinder swindler and other people like that see this stuff and they're like, no way. And they just move on. They don't even say, they don't even say fuck off. They just like <laughs> delete the message or they swipe or they scroll or whatever they do. And that's in a way part of how it all works. Because if, if you were a scammer and you were trying to talk skeptical people into swallowing for uh, swallowing all of this, you'd be working way too hard for too low a success rate. Um, you have to balance your cost and benefits as the scammer too. And that's what all of these good scammers who have succeeded for a long time uh, and, and run these long cons do. They invest only in the really good prospects, right? As, as, as we say on Glen Gary, Glen Ross, right? The, the good leads, you know, they get the good leads, you know, and then they go and it's, I don't mean to disparage sort of the, pro the, the process of sales, which can be done very ethically and, and so on. But there are some similarities between marketing and, um, and sales and, and other forms of influence that have darker, you know, ultimately darker purposes. And, and I think the selection principle is a really good one. You want the best customers to raise their hands and say, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to make a deal. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. No wonder they get pissed off at me when I try to keep them on the line as long as possible. I always <laughs> yeah, like to have you're, these you're, you're scam baiting. You're being yeah. a scam baiter, in fact, <laughs> yeah. right? That there are, whole, there are these people who just try to deliberately waste the scammers time in order to help them <laughs> go out of business and, and uh, you know, all, all, uh, all glory to, to those people who are willing to invest in that to help oh, the rest I, of us. I, I, well, it's part of my job in part to study why people believe weird things, so to, so to speak, <laughs> and how long how the con man works, you know, so I had one guy on, on the line. I was just, I just walked outside and I was outdoors, but I'm like, okay, I'm in my car now. I'm going to the Starbucks to get the gift cards. Like you told me to now, which Starbucks am I supposed to go? I'm on the, I'm on the one-on-one freeway now. <laughs> and I, you know, I kept this guy on for about 15, 20 minutes before he glommed on. And then I had one from England. Uh, and I later realized he, he used the Ted talk, um, uh, just, you know, author page. And it turns out he emailed everybody there. But he's basically inviting me to come speak at, at this university in England and so on. And, you know, what's your prize? So I, I, he had, like, all caps in there and all that stuff. So, I, okay. So, yeah, oh, it's $50,000. Oh, yeah, no problem. I'm like, oh, really? So it's at 100000 <laughs> Yeah. <Okay. laughs> and then uh, it's like, okay, what's the, you know, where's the catch here? And then finally we got to the point after, you know, half a dozen emails. Now, you got to get this terrorism certificate before you can enter the country. So here's the, the contact for the terrorism, just to make sure you're not a terrorist. And this will clear you, and then it's all good. <laughs> right? So I'm like, okay. <laughs> so then I had my art department actually make up a terrorism certificate. Michael Shermer is here by, by cleared. He is not a terrorist. He passed it. So I sent it to him. He goes, no, no, that's the wrong one. <laughs> you got to use this company. <laughs> and it was like, you know, 1500 bucks for the terrorism certificate, something like that. <laughs> that I, I've, I've never heard of the terrorism certificate scam, but I think that's... <laughs> Yeah. That, that's a great one. Uh, and it does strike me, though, that it, for just $1,500, they are going through a lot of effort for that. So this seems like a little bit of a low-rent scam. Although, of course, if you had sent them the terrorism certificate from the officially sanctioned terrorism certificate sales corporation, <laughs> I suspect they would have asked you for something more after that. Yeah, probably. Uh, because I think the general pattern is they don't let you go until you let them go. <laughs> really, they'll find something new, right, to... To ask right. for once they have a really a, a really good uh, prospect. Then I've seen some new ones where texts come through on my cell phone. Uh, you know, hey, how's it going? Or uh, you know, hey, Michael. Or anyway, so uh, one last week I did. I posted this on Twitter where you know it said something like, uh, "Is this the correct number?" And and I just texted back. I said, "I told you not to contact me. I thought we agreed that we're going to lay low till the heat is off." You know, I did what you told me to do. I ditched the gun. I hid the money. And I get this thing back. I went, oh, my God, I'm, I got the wrong number. <laughs> <laughs> I said, then I texted back. I said, please don't call the police. They'll never find the body anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hope nobody's reading your texts too carefully from, from any law enforcement agencies or anything <laughs> yeah. like that. But yeah, exactly. Well, the last people they want to be dealing with are people like them, right? Mm -hmm. That's, you know, so when, when, when cheaters confront cheaters, you know, then you you get into a lose lose situation. There's a there's a funny a funny story from the world of chess cheating. So uh, chess players, you know, or or non chess players can cheat in online chess by using surreptitiously using their phone or another computer or even another window on their computer to run a chess program that tells them what moves to play. And of course, chess programs are so good nowadays that you could you could beat the world champion if he didn't know you were using a computer for your for your moves. 
And once players get flagged as being using uh, computers to cheat in that way, usually they get banned from the site. So chess.com will basically ban their account or close it or something like that. But uh, one grandmaster suggested that instead of banning them, they should just put them in a special walled off part of chess.com where all the cheaters play each other. So it'd basically be pe pe people fighting each other with their computers and having no idea that they're playing other people who are cheaters. So <laughs> maybe getting great. the scammers talking to each other, you know, is a good way to sort of waste their time uh, uh, as well. <laughs> That's really funny. That's right. You play grandmaster level chess, right? Uh, well, oh, on a really play? good day, I'm that good. Okay. I'm, I'm, All I'm right. te technically just a master, but, uh, okay. I did draw right. a grandmaster in a recent tournament. So I'll, well, I'll remember play. the, um, there was the mechanical Turk chess player that turned out to actually have a little person inside the machine that was making the moves, right? That was centuries. Ago. Yes. Now it's the opposite. Now it's the human who turns out to have a computer, which is the way of <laughs> right. cheating, right? Instead of, right. instead of the opposite. Now in an actual chess tournament where people are present, don't they check for like a little ear plug or something that somebody's listening or, you know, whatever, uh, using a computer? It varies quite widely, the, the level of cheating enforcement among tournaments. So, for example, in the World Championship match, which is just two people playing against each other, they're in a soundproof, not exactly a Faraday cage, but it's a soundproof booth. They are examined closely. They have doping tests and all kinds of things like that. Okay. There's all kinds of people and cameras. Yes, for, oh, they, I, I, I don't know what the banned substances are, but I imagine they are things like modafinil and, and Adderall and things that make give you a cognitive advantage in the short term or something like that. Um, hmm. But they, 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 they test those very carefully. Of course, if you just go to the local tournament at your chess club or, or something like that, nobody's going to be going to those levels. Um, there are rules against it and rules about especially oriented towards phones. You can't have a phone on your body. You have to put it in a bag or you have to, have to be turned completely off, of course, uh, and so on. So there are different levels of cheat detection. And at most of the international tournaments, I, I think it's, I, I may be a little naive, but I think the cheating rate is fairly low. It doesn't disrupt the game uh, too much. Of course, people who feel they're victims of cheating can have very negative reactions to that. And different people have different levels of thinking they're being cheated, right? Some people are very paranoid about cheaters. And I say paranoid colloquially. I don't mean they... They have a diagnosis or anything, but they're very concerned. They have a, a low threshold for perceiving cheating. Other people like me have a fairly high threshold for it, and maybe we're we're a little bit uh, overshooting it. The, the, really, the big controversy in, in chess cheating um, uh, was uh, back in September of 2022 when the world champion dropped out of a tournament for essentially the first time in his entire career. Uh, and, and he's been the world champion for 10 years at that point. He dropped out of a tournament essentially because he accused one of his opponents of cheating in a game that he had just lost. And he doesn't lose too many games, being the world champion, but it does happen. And he accused his opponent of cheating. Uh, and um, the interesting thing that, 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 that I thought happened after that was, well, there was no real evidence that he was cheating. You, you can't tell that someone's cheating just from the moves of one game, because sometimes people just play so well that essentially they're playing the same moves a computer would make. That could be because they had a really good day, because... Their opponent just played in such a way as to make sort of the, the 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 correct moves easier to find. And one game is not enough evidence. But a lot of people just believe the world champion. For one thing, there's sort of an expertise bias. Oh, he's the world champion at chess. He must know everything about chess. But he's not the world champion at cheat detection. You know, that's a different that's a different matter, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we have referees in sports rather than just the top athletes refereeing their own games. Um, he's not the world champion of cheat detection. But once people accepted the premise that he had been cheated against, they started to hyper-analyze all the previous games by the guy he alleged had been cheating, uh, who's a, a, well, a kid, he was 19 years old at the time, I believe, named Hans Niemann. And uh, people started speculating, how could he have done it? Maybe he had anal beads that were vibrating to <laughs> oh with different God. different what? signals to tell him which squares to move <laughs> from and to and, and so on. And uh, he even offered to play naked inside a glass box to prove that he was not you know, with a with an, a Faraday cage or whatever to prove that he was not cheating. But a lot of people just assumed he was. And and the, to me, the interesting thing is they went off and they proceeded, of course, to find evidence that he was cheating. Because if you think something anomalous is going on, but you don't have a hypothesis as to exactly what, you can find some strange pattern in any kind of behavior. You, you could, any sequence of numbers, you can find something weird about it, right? Too many odd numbers, too many even numbers. Too many numbers that are prime, not enough numbers that are prime. Oh, an odd number of sevens showed up in there, you know, and 
and and so on. So you can do that, and that's that's what it did. So it, it to me it was not so much an example of an illustration of cheating. That's still in dispute, but a great example of how people's pre-existing expectations and beliefs, as we know from cognitive science, can really drive how they interpret everything and and lead them to some, uh, you know, really obscure and uh, well, no, obscure is the wrong word, absurd and. Uh, sort of troubling conclusions, right? This guy's sort of been blackballed from the top level events. Um, he has to play in lower level events, and it's hard to get the guy better that got when a, you're playing the guy weaker that got players. Accused. The guy that got accused? Is yes, the... correct, yes. Uh, the world champion is, well, he's not the world champion anymore because he gave up being world champion just because he didn't want to be world champion anymore. He's still the highest rated player, but he's fine. It's the guy who was accused, who's now 20 years old. Uh, I saw him at the last tournament I played in, and he almost won the tournament, but... um. Uh, you know, he's, he's got to go to the same tournaments as me now, instead of being able to play in like the mm. top level invitational tournaments that he would like to be playing in. I vaguely remember that story. It was, he's, I forget if he's the accused or the accuser, but he's, uh, autistic and he has like wavy, thick black hair. And, um, and it, this, it was like a New York times story that uh, he's accused or he's accusing somebody of cheating. I forget who that is. Well, is the, that the guy you're the, talking about? Uh, I don't know that he's autistic. I don't, I don't know that that's a, that that's a fact, but he does have, um, sort of a big, uh, you know, big hair. And, um, this case was written up in the wall street journal and the New York times and elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, it got Elon Musk to tweet about it. Um, I think Elon Musk retweeted the anal beads theory, of course, <laughs> of course. um, <laughs> have to pick Funny. out what he would be interested in, in that, in that, in that topic. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know about any autism or anything like that, but of course it, it, it turned out it, this is another thing about, you know, con artists and cheaters and, and scammers that is not often appreciated. They're, they're often recidivists and it's surprising. It was surprising to us how many times we came across stories of scams where if people had checked out the criminal or civil or professional sanctions record of the people they'd been interacting with, they would have found out that the people had committed fraud or been accused of fraud or sued for fraud or settled, you know, before. And if they had just stopped dealing with them at that point, um, you know, they they would have saved themselves a lot of, of money and heartache. The Orlando Museum of Art did an entire exhibit of Jean-Michel Basquiat paintings, which had been previously unknown, were rediscovered in a Los Angeles uh, warehouse or storage unit or something like that after the death of the owner. And, and the people who had rediscovered them and essentially sold the Orlando Museum on this exhibit turned out all had some kind of criminal records of some sort, many in, in many cases involving fraud. Uh, and I just have a feeling that if the people running the museum had known the backgrounds of these folks, I don't know that they didn't know them, but if they had looked into them, they might not have mounted an entire exhibit just of newly rediscovered and probably completely forged uh, Basquiat paintings. And I say probably because there has been no court case to conclude it yet, but the FBI was convinced enough that they raided the museum and seized the entire exhibit while it was going on. So I think there's there's probably some reasonable evidence there. But, but get, getting back to Hans Niemann, he had cheated and he admitted having cheated in online chess when he was younger. He was only 19 when he played this game yeah. against the world champion. So there is, of course, probably that that should be some uh, information that as a good Bayesian should cause you to sort of increase your, uh, you know, your your uh, your prior probability that he might cheat again. Um, but is it good enough? I don't think so. And of course, there's the question of is what you did at age 14 or age 16 really, you know, something we should be making strong predictions on, you know, based on once you're an adult. Uh, I think in, in, the, in, in most cheating cases, we need stronger evidence to, to really ruin someone's career, you know, based on, based on those kinds of accusations. Yeah. Interesting. I had a guy over to my house last year who's a member of the club I belong to and his kids play with my kid and so on. And, uh, he's quite the talker. He tells, you know, wild stories at the club. And anyways, he comes up to the, to the house and, and I have a chess set there. I don't play a lot of chess, but I've had a chess set since I was a kid. I have the same chess set. I just kind of give it to my kid and so on. Anyway, so he goes, oh, you play chess? I go, well, kind of a little bit. Oh, yeah, I used to play, you know, like you. I used to play master level chess. I played some grandmaster. I'm like, oh, well, you don't want to play me. I can't even beat the level one on my Apple computer. <laughs> so <laughs> and then, uh, so that was one data point. And then we got to talking about the club and tennis. And he, oh, yeah, yeah, I, play. I, I hit with Jimmy Connors all the time. You know, he lives here in Santa Barbara. Like, you hit with Jimmy Connors. <laughs> All right. Well, you don't want to play me because I'm not playing play a Jimmy Connors level, you know. And then the third one we're talking about because I'm, I'm a cyclist and talking about doping and Lance Armstrong. And I, I'm telling him about all this stuff because I've, I've written quite a bit about it. 
And he's like, oh, yeah, I used to be on the juice. Yeah, totally. I was just totally ripped and taking roids. And now, and mind you, the guy sitting across from me looks like Pee Wee Herman. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's it. And then he throws in for good measure. I was doing it when I was in the special forces, you know, and working <laughs> down in South America, you know, overthrowing some dictators. I'm like, okay, that's it. You're out. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that's what I mean. That's that's a, sort of another common theme in, um, in in clever con artistry is right is to sort of like assert unverifiable facts. Like maybe you could talk to Jimmy Connors, right? But how are you going to find out whether someone was really in the special forces and what undercover operations they were doing? They're they're sort of a they're they're sort of the one of the ways of figuring out that you're being cheated is to keep on asking questions and maybe eventually you know you'll get an unsatisfactory answer. That's an attempt to sort of although it wasn't in this format of like. I don't think he thought you were investigating him at the time, but sometimes people, to make their stories more convincing, they they sort of act as though they're being investigated and they hit you with something that you can't really mm. question any further, right? Because there's no way mm. you could get that information. And the mere fact that he decided to throw out the special forces, as you saw, was sort of a red flag because you're pretty savvy about these things. But a lot of people have been taken in by exactly the same claim, that there's some guy who was in special forces, Delta Force, SEAL Team 6, you know, CIA, whatever it is, you know, and... Um, that works a lot of the time, but I think it, it, I, one of the things we talk about in the book is how often the things that maybe should make us more skeptical or more likely to think we're being conned actually are the very things that we sometimes take as signals of authentic, authenticity and trustworthiness, right? It's a, it, it, it's really hard, I think, to evade being fooled sometimes because the same things can mean both, uh, you know, both that, that someone should be trusted and that you should really actually look further. and. You know, learning what the line is between those things, not easy, but I think enough enough stories and examples and, and sort of understanding the framework for how these things work might might help people. Right. How would you fact check a lot of these things? I wouldn't know who to call, you know, and he could always just say, well, I'd tell you, but I have to kill you. You know, it was classified. It's top secret. <laughs> you know, oh, OK. <laughs> if I met Jimmy Carr, I said, do you know this guy? But I haven't anyway. So. But uh, that <laughs> reminds me of another one I, I'm, I'm calling the Strava Con. So Strava is this app on your phone you, that for exercise. It records every one of your workouts. And you follow other people. They follow you and so on. You can just see what everybody else is doing. So I do this for my cycling. And uh, so there was one that broke about a year ago. And then there was a long story about it. That this guy, he's like now he's 45 years old or whatever. You know, he was a CEO of this, fortune, of this uh, European version of a Fortune 500 company. And he was in special forces. And he did this. And he did that. It just went on and on. And at, at but but he, he never got caught. This went on for like 20 years. And then he posted on Strava a particular segment of a of a massive climb on his bike that like only the Tour de France, you know, all time greatest would be able to do this climb at this speed. Right. So and basically the guy that had the KOM, the king of the mountain for that particular segment, people go out and try to break each other's segment times and so on. Uh, the guy who held the KOM for that, you know, looked at that and went, no way this guy did at 45 years old. And so he busted him and then the whole thing unraveled. And so it was the, it was the KOM, the one guy who knows how fast that can be done. He, he could fact check that. Yeah. How did he, how did he hack the app so that he could post an impossible route? Does the app just oh, you take just, your word for you, it that you, you just, cycled you there? You just I... do it on a moped or uh, on a motorcycle. Oh, or I see. Okay. Like, so you do it, but you, you enter it as though it's a bicycle, uh, as though it's a right. cycling. That, that, oh, I right. see what you mean. Okay. Because right. I figured yeah. like if you, if you walked it, it would be too slow to be biking. So yeah, the GPS right. yeah. would tell the tale, but, uh, oh, well, so he must've done it in a really super record time if he was using a moped or, or, or something like that. Doing, that. Right. Yeah. yeah the, well, the, even, even if you're doing a solo segment, but you're actually in a pack of cyclists that are going 25 instead of you'd be doing 18 by yourself or something, people uh, look for that. Like, Hey, Hey, that wasn't right. Uh, or if there was a tailwind or things like that. Well, that, that is one of the main, uh, ways to catch uh, a lot of fraud is to be an expert, right? So the guy who knew how hard it was to do this was probably the biggest expert on that precise little thing. You know, on that trail, that mountain, you know, that mm -hmm. that device, that, you know, that type of bicycle or whatever. Uh, and, and he knew it. And this um, this comes up, this comes up fairly often. But on the flip side, um, also people who have been very high achieving in some areas, let's say Fortune 500 CEOs, can often be conned in other areas. Uh, one reason being that I think due to the... Um, sort of luck factor in success, um, people who have gotten to the top of whatever they're in, unless it's sort of almost purely a 
a pursuit like maybe chess or something like that, where like your, your, your performance level is very tightly correlated with your actual underlying skill. CEOs, your performance level is not that tightly correlated to your underlying skill because there's all kinds of things outside your control that affect your stock price and your revenue and, and so on. For example, the other thousands of people who work for your company and the, the millions of people who work for the other companies. But once you get there, right, you, you may have the perception that um, you got there through your own, you know, through your own talent, through your own genius. And you may believe that the decisions you've made, which were probably to some extent or largely made on instinct, um, were not lucky, but were rather, you know, sort of skilled. And uh, there have been many cases where these these types of folks make sort of equally quick, intuitive decisions in other areas of life, but they're not as good <laughs> in those, or they don't have the the luck factor, you know, on their on their side in those cases, and they've been swindled out of out of a lot, um, uh, or or just made terrible decisions, right, in, in different in different areas, um, without sort of realizing that they're that vulnerable. I think. So your your thesis on your default to truth or truth bias is that most people do not uh, tell grandiose lies like that. Most people don't say they were in special forces and all this kind of stuff. So 99% of the time, let's say, is to make up a number. Uh, the people I'm talking to at the club or wherever, my cycling buddies and whatnot, were just chit-chatting. They're not making up shit like that. Most of the stuff they say is reasonably close to the truth. Maybe they exaggerate by 10% their height or their income or something like that, but it's not enough to to worry about. Yeah, so um interesting you use 99% by the way because one of the <laughs> yeah. ways that people one of the ways people fool us is by making very precise statements which sort of leads us to believe that they're backed by a lot of data or evidence or some kind of scientific um you know scientific information. There was there was one there was one company we saw their website it, on one page it said they would their, their training program would 3x your productivity and on another page on the same website it said it would 6x your your productivity. And then in, in the Google search results, that's at five X, you know, so it almost like didn't matter to them, like what it was, as long as it was a precise number, we won't just maim, we won't just improve your productivity. We'll do something more precise with it. Um, in your case, you were joking, of course, uh, on purpose, but we do get, well, because you have the line in there about the the baseball player says, you know, he could have hit it, hit that ball out in 99% of the ballparks. (laughs) There's only 30 ballparks. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So 90, (laughs) yeah, well, exactly. So that's, that's kind of, you know, Sometimes it takes an expert, in this case, another manager who knows how many ballparks there are and what you know to to, to figure out that the you know where the you know where the um, where the mistake mistake lies. As far as truth bias goes, I think it is true that most of the time most people are telling us true things, and I would even go farther to say that most of the time when people are not telling us true things, they don't mean to be telling us untrue things. They're just accidentally telling us untrue things or maybe exaggerating in a white lie sort of sort of sense. Um, so it is uh, much more efficient for us to accept what people are saying, at least initially, um, without further investigation, as opposed to disbelieve it or maintain it in some kind of purgatory of belief where we, we neither tag it as true or false and we just somehow go on with our lives. It's It probably, you know, there might maybe even be a way to sort of with, with the appropriate math or logic prove that, you know, such a system that did not automatically tag things as true would have a really tough time making decisions, at least in, you know, in a reasonable uh, time scale and with the amount of information we have access to. So we assume things are true. And if things are repeated enough, we don't have time to investigate them. The belief can solidify without our ever really initially really thinking those things were true, but just because of the initial truth bias and repetition and our failure to go back and check. I've sort of even felt this myself sometimes, like in real time, I can feel myself hearing something a politician frequently says, hearing it for like the fourth or fifth time on the news or something like that. And it feels more true merely because I've heard it before, even though I've never looked into it. Um, But if you think back, it's always the same person saying it. They have their own reasons for saying it, that their interests might not align with mine. But if you don't have time to think about those things, you can wind up being fooled essentially by your truth bias. So there's kind of an underlying rationality to believing what most people in your group or society tell you, because most of the time it's reasonably accurate. It's a little bit like the um, uh, madness of crowd, or no, 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 the uh, wisdom of crowds uh, or the the poll the audience. On, uh, under most conditions, they usually get it right. So I was thinking about this when a year, about 10 years ago, I did a series of replication studies for Dateline NBC with Chris Hansen. We replicated the Milgram experiment and a bunch of the other famous ones, including the smoke in the room. 
So we have our subject. They're they're tr they're they're filling out this form to try out for this reality TV show because everybody wants to be on TV, right? So it's easy to get people to do this. So we start just pumping in theater smoke underneath the door. Now everybody in the room is just the actors working for us, filling out a form. And the one guy is sitting there filling out his form, and he's looking back and forth. You know, the smoke is pouring into the room. He's looking left. He's looking right. And everybody's dutifully filling out their form. He thinks, well, okay. Then he goes back to filling out his form. Now, in the old, you know, uh, 60s, 70s versions of this, it was always treated like, well, these guys are just idiots, you know, conforming to the crowd, not thinking for themselves. Come on. But in fact, that kind of social proof, like, well, I look left, I look right. Somebody would do something if this was really a problem. That's actually reasonable and rational. It's it's not totally irrational, I think. Uh, there's got to be some kind of dividing line. If, if, if there's a person dying in the middle of the street and... The first couple of people don't notice that person. And then the third person notices those other people looking in some other direction. And the fourth person notices those three, right? You could get a crowd behavior that is completely, you know, horrible for, <laughs> you know, for, for the, for yes. the person involved and right. probably not something that most of those people, if you questioned them at another time would wish they had done. Right. So there's some rationality to it because if a bunch of people have looked at something and have considered it and have decided it's not something to worry about. It's probably reasonable not to worry about it yourself. But how do we know that they have really looked into it so deeply and that they formed a considered judgment or even noticed? One, one thing I've always thought about those bystander studies, this is kind of an example of a bystander study, um, the smoke coming into the room and, and someone it, you know, not taking any, uh, any, any action. Um, there were other similar ones, I believe. One thing I've always wondered about them is do the people who supposedly... Uh, walk past something they should have stopped and intervened with, do they notice it? Like, did they really notice mm. it or did they assign it the right meaning? Kind of like mm. the defensive players in that football clip. Like, they saw what was happening, but they didn't actually assign it the right meaning. And um, Dan Simons and I, co you know, co-author of Nobody's Fool and the Invisible Gorilla, and I, we did a, uh, an experiment um, many years ago where we found that we staged a fight. Uh, on a college campus, on Union College campus, where I was a professor at the time, we staged a fight, got some students to pretend to be fighting. And then we had participants in our experiment run past where the fight was. And we had them paying attention to something else, basically following someone. Uh, and we asked them at the end, uh, a minute or so later, did you notice anyone fighting along the path? And a huge percentage of them didn't even notice it at all. So <laughs> how can you intervene if you don't even see what's going on? Um, oh, I see. Right. Uh, so not to say that all those bystander studies are all cases of inattentional blindness, which is what this phenomenon of not noticing something important um, when you're paying attention to something else. That's what that phenomenon is called. But uh, it could be that a portion of the sort of bystander effects and what we may interpret as, oh, they're r rationally responding to social information might be they're just not noticing. <laughs> they're just not noticing the thing or in right. interpreting it the right way to even get to the point of saying, oh, I, I you know, I, I ought to. I ought to intervene uh, on that. Yeah, by the way, I can't show your gorilla video anymore because everybody's seen it. <laughs> I think the last time I tried it on uh, my students, maybe three or four years ago, I heard this like, oh, this again. <laughs> I went, yeah. oh. <laughs> well, I, I don't, I, yeah, I, I don't want to be one of those people who complains about the no one wants to see the greatest hits anymore <laughs> um, because right. uh, it turns out that that's, I mean, to, to our you know, fortunately for us, that Invisible Girl experiment replicates. It replicates so well that TV producers, as you know, have done it. High school classes do it. You can do it live. Um, Darren Brown had a gorilla come out on a stage show. There's all kinds mm -hmm. of versions of this thing that, you know, that work perfectly. But not only that, but it, it generalizes to other kinds of things, too. So Dan has another version of this video where other things happen in the background while the gorilla is there and people don't notice those other things, even though they're expecting to see a gorilla. And there are versions with computer shapes moving around on a screen and uh, driving sim simulations and so on. It's really a very, uh, lucky for us, a very robust effect compared to some of the things in, mm -hmm. in psychological science that don't, you know, that don't really seem to work as well or, or may have involved cases of researchers sort of deceiving themselves into thinking they were finding uh, true, true phenomena that didn't, didn't really exist. Or, of course, in the worst case, deliberately committing fraud on their colleagues by making up data claiming that there was something happening that, that didn't really exist. Yeah, I want to get into all that in a minute, but we did that as part of the replication studies for that uh, Dateline 2020, or Dateline NBC. Uh, Chris Hansen actually walked across the stage while we had two sets of basketball players passing the balls around and so on. But I upped it and had everybody in the audience, there's maybe 100 people there, count out loud the number of passes. And that really 
made them super blind. So it, you call it inattentional blindness. It seems like it could just be called attentional. You're just directing somebody's attention so focused on something, they don't see anything else. Yeah, we call it inattentional because the thing you don't notice is you don't notice because you don't pay attention to it. So the idea is that sort of attention is more required for perception than we than we might realize. Um, I know some people do call it attentional blindness. There are various names that people are people mm. give it, but in the literature, you know, it's called inattentional blindness. So we tend to we tend to stick with that. There's the mm. corresponding problem, which we called in our previous book, um, the illusion of attention, which is the mistaken belief that you are paying attention to everything and you will notice anything unexpected that happens which is revealed to be a false belief by all of the effects we've just been talking about of how people don't notice extremely salient things that, that they would notice if they, if they were paying attention to them. Yeah, certainly for drivers and pilots, things like that, it has ap applications that are important. All right, let's talk about the Nexium cult. Um, in, in general, I'm fond of saying, uh, you know, no one actually joins a cult. They join, no one in the history of the world has ever joined a cult. They join a group that they think is going to be good. Take someone like Jim Jones. And if you look at the history of, of, of Jim Jones, he was actually, you know, kind of a pioneering, uh, what we would today call a, a progressive woke preacher. You know, he moved from Indiana to San Francisco and the whole Bay Area. It was very segregated. He integrated his church there. You know, he was manning the soup kitchens for the poor people in, in San Francisco. You can see pictures of him and Governor Jerry Brown, his first round there and civic leaders. And, you know, people joined that group. You know, yeah, that's a good social justice cause I want to get behind. You know, and then 15 volts at a time, so to speak, 20 years later, <laughs> you're down in Guyana drinking the Kool-Aid. How does that happen? So that's what you're really focused on, like with Nexium. Well, this is a self-help group. There's thousands of those, the Tony Robbins types and empowerment of women. Well, yeah, who, who's against that? And, uh, you know, and so forth and so on. Well, we don't know, I guess, because I've seen all the documentaries on Nexium. how many people, women, took these seminars and uh, how many actually got the, the branding on their, in their groin area? Uh, I don't have that number myself. Um, I don't think anybody does. Yeah. Yeah. Co coincidentally, the whole Nexium story started to break with, as far as I know, that first story in the New York Times, um, which revealed the branding uh, while uh, I was living in the area in upstate New York. And it, it we, we had we had actually lived even closer. We had almost lived literally down the road from their um, their executive offices where they would run those those seminars where they supposedly taught people to empower themselves and take control of their lives and uh, and, and taught this sort of bizarre curriculum that that Keith Ranieri had had invented. Um, so it was a very local story for for me um, for me at first. Uh, I think there's a, a number of interesting things about uh, about Nexium. One, as you mentioned, um, it evolved from a relatively benign maybe form of deception, right? Multi-level marketing organizations and so on are in a way a fraudulent kind of business because they're sort of like Ponzi schemes. Um, the people at the bottom usually wind up like buying a bunch of inventory or contributing to the company, but not getting that money back. Kind of like the last investors in mm. Bernie Madoff's fund never got any payouts. They had to, of course, wait for the bankruptcy process to happen. Um, so there is there is that. Also, Keith Ranieri was a uh, a guy who made extremely boastful claims about himself. He got himself described as the smartest man in the world. I I don't know even of any. I've done some work in intelligence testing and so on. I don't know of any way that you could possibly validate such a claim. Uh, like anyone who does psychometric tests, know that like the farther out into the tail of distribution you get, the harder and harder it is to tell tell people apart. Um, and anyhow, there's no validated IQ test that goes up that high and, and so on. But the point is, if you came into his organization or his orbit, knowing that one fact about him and believing it, you now have made a commitment to something that can let you rationalize a lot of other things. So if, you're, if you think you're dealing with the smartest man in the world, almost anything he says you're much more likely to accept as true or accurate or real or at least worthy of serious consideration um, than if you thought he was just some guy running a multi-level marketing company, right? Um, that's the, that's part of this, the, the secret sauce. And then, of course, as, as I think you alluded to, we only know about the people, we, we know the most about the people who stayed in the group the longest. And in many cases, wound up having such deep regrets that they made entire documentary films and podcasts and so on about the experience of writing books. But what about all the people who showed up to one of those seminars, thought, 
this is a little bit wacky and never came back or maybe canceled canceled their payment, you know, because we don't know about all those people. And that's the selection process, again, that, that works very well. You start out with a multi-level marketing organization. As it turns into a cult, for whatever reason, um, people drop off who don't, you know, who don't feel that strongly. So you sort of, you, you don't brainwash everybody necessarily. You just keep the most suggestible. Um, and they were suggestible all along and they were willing to believe all along and, and you lead them down that path because they're the ones who, who are willing to stay with it. Um, it's, and if I recall, if I recall that the, the women who got branded were themselves brought into that whole secret club by other women. So again, you have that kind of social proof. Well, it's gotta be okay. I mean, a woman would. Yes. And it, it, yeah. In, in many, in many cases, yes. I don't know the exact relation relationships among all of them, but, but certainly these, so-called master slave relationships and so on it was it was women with women it was not you know it ultimately led up to keith ranieri um but it was um yeah so i think that's a good point there's there's sort of uh there, there's always a um uh, uh there there's a, a main element in in the success of a lot of frauds is the use of simply what we refer to as familiarity right you if if, if people like you recruit you then you're more likely to get in. And if people you know recruit you, you're more likely to get in. So uh, minor celebrities were used in Nexium also as sort of, uh, they were sort of put out there as, as um, uh, examples of, of uh, famous members. And some of them were, they were like Mexican politicians, there were sort of Hollywood actresses and so on. It's, I think it, it, one thing we, we noticed while working on this book was if you look at any long running complicated scam like this, they're really using like almost all of the cognitive tools that we talk about in the book in one form or another. You can't keep it going that long just based on relying on people to make one mistake in essence. Or uh, So you could probably find examples of all of those things in there. Um, I bet Keith Ranieri didn't just say, I'm the smartest man in the world. I bet he said, I have a 187 IQ or something like that. Much more precise, right? Like, okay, mm -hmm. it must be real if it's 187 IQ instead of just the smartest man in the world. Right, I think uh, Epps, or not Epstein, Weinstein used, uh, he had women assistants bring these actresses up to his hotel room uh, where the business meeting was going to happen. And then, and th I've always been curious about this story. Who, who were these female assistants of his and how come they've not been tracked down? Or maybe they have, I don't know. But, um, uh, you know, they have some culpability in this. They had to know that, you know, this is not normal. You know, the boss is having me bring these beautiful actresses up to his hotel room at 10 at night for a meeting, and they seem to go along with it, but I don't know. Uh, that one I don't know anything about, although in, uh, you, you mentioned Epstein, and ironically, in the, you know, sadly, in the case of Epstein, the same, the same situation, right? A lot of the alleged recruiting was was being done by women. Like Ghislaine. Ghislaine Jeffrey Epstein well. was, not sending, was not sending sketchy guys, like, out to out out to pick up uh you know out to pick up some of these uh some of these women and of course the recruiting was usually under a different premise it was under the premise of massage therapy or you know something yeah. like that right well galane galane maxwell was his recruiter so uh, she's certainly in trouble now um yep. right so uh let's talk about bernie madoff again that's an affinity scam of sorts uh you know it's uh, one of our fellow jews is gonna he certainly is not gonna screw us and and is it possible it actually was legitimate at the beginning? It, it, he really did know what he was doing, and then he got behind the eight ball and just had to scramble and just could not get out from under that and had to keep it going? I, I think that's the main theory about, that, that's to me the most plausible theory, and I think the most accepted one about what was going on. But what's in dispute is is when that started happening. Mm. So apparently as early as the first couple of years that he was managing people's money, way back in the early 60s, he made some mistakes and lost a lot of money and tried to cover for it and just be so successful in the next couple of years that he could pay them back and smooth it over and, and, and no one would notice. Um, whether at that point somehow the seed was planted that he could, uh, you know, that he could do this or whether it started after the crash of 1987 or whether it started in the early 90s. It, se it seems like everybody seems to agree that after 1993, he never made a, a legitimate trade for anyone who was in that fund. That that was a clear break point. The records are not as clear earlier than that. As to whether it's an affinity fraud, uh, it is an affinity fraud in the sense that uh, his victims um, were, uh, I don't know if largely, but many of his victims 
and many of his biggest victims probably were people who he had some affinity with, um, either through religion or through charitable organizations or through um, some other social connection. But there were lots who did, lot, lots who didn't. I mean, and there were all kinds of other principles involved in this fraud besides just preying on the people who are sort of predisposed to trust you. That was an important aspect, but there was a lot more to it. There was a lot more to it than that. Mm. And then I always wonder, like with cult leaders and people like this, um, to what extent did they know this is a scam or have they self-deceived themselves? Um, but, you, you know, I, I have to think about Bob Trivers theory of deception and self-deception. You're better at selling the lie if you believe it yourself. But, you know, like these psychics who get, do readings, do they really believe that they can psychically read people or they do they know this is bullshit? Uh, I, and- I wonder that. I wonder exactly that a lot, especially about the psychics. As far as self-deception goes, I think that's an excellent theory of self-deception because it's a paradoxical behavior. Why, why would people, why would people essentially deceive themselves? And, and probably the reason is so that they can be more convincing uh, to others. Right. And there's a whole, there, there, as you know, there are many theories about why reasoning works the way it does that are based on the idea that it's evolved, not to give us the right answers, but to uh, enable us to talk other people, <laughs> talk other people into things. Um, now in the case of uh, psychics, um, I've talked to Dan about this quite a bit. This is like a recurring a recurring discussion because he knows some magicians and mentalists mm-hmm. and, and so on, and you probably do too. I don't really know too many people in that world, although I do have a funny picture of me with Penn and Teller in Las Vegas and uh, nice. amazing how tall Teller is. That's the, that's the take-home message from that picture. Everyone thinks he's short because he stands next to Penn, who's enormous, but turns out he's really, really big himself. I think that what is going on is um, some of them don't know what they're really what they're doing. I don't know if they have doubts or not, but I think they don't actually know that they are just purely doing cold reading by the book Mm -hmm. and using all the, literally all the techniques in the book. I think some of them obviously do know that and they're just committing massive fraud because there's a lot of evidence that some psychics will figure out some of the people in the audience or plant people in the audience, but especially figure some of them out and then look up information about them online in advance and memorize it so that they can appear to have cold read it on the stage. And to me, once you realize that they're doing that, that kind of bursts the whole bubble. Like, mm-hmm. what's the point of it all if they're doing that? And uh, one of the ways that they have been revealed to be doing that is people have deliberately gone to their shows, bought tickets, and established fake Facebook profiles in advance to see if they will, and, and sure enough, in and, and a couple of occasions, the cold readers have, you know, intuited stuff that was only in the fake online profile that wasn't really correct about the person. So that, to me, largely cracks that case. And, and I think once you learn the techniques of, uh, of cold reading and, and mentalism, and we go over some of them in, in, in the book, because it, once you learn those techniques, you can see them being applied so well that you almost, I think, can't have any other belief in what's going on than, than that. I do think it's possible to just get a few things right by accident and convince yourself that you're a psychic and and not understand where your, you know, where your accuracy is, is actually coming from. Yeah. I knew a guy that worked for the psychic friends network magician back in the nineties who, you know, I said, well, you know, what's the ethics of this? And he said, well, you know, I I actually am helping people. And sometimes I do get things that, you know, I, I didn't look up or anything like that. like, yeah, but you know, the confirmation bias, remember the hitch, forget the misses and so on. You, you know, cold reading things are true for most people. You know, you've lost a, uh, you have a scar on your knee or there's a number three in your address, or, you know, you're missing an earring. You used to wear your hair longer when you were younger, things like this. There's this book called the full fact book of cold reading by Ian Rowland. You probably know that book. book. Yeah. Excellent book. Yeah. And he has hundreds of things you could say. And it's astonishing that (laughs) how many people it's correct for. The first time I ever saw James Van Prague, the psychic, again in the 90s, um, the Unsolved Mysteries did, I think it was Unsolved Mysteries, did a whole uh, ser- a day of, of recording him doing readings, and I was one of the people just sitting in the audience. He didn't know who I was. And uh, so I kind of noticed him working it, and every guy there, all of us were there because we'd lost somebody. Uh, and uh, in my case, it was my father. But when he came to me, uh, you know, he, he thought it was my brother. I'm like, okay, it's my brother. Go ahead. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he did this whole thing. It's like, well, you know, and afterwards I said, well, you know, actually my brother's still alive, so I don't know who are you talking to. <laughs> and people got mad at me about this. But I did notice he, for did everyone. You, say, the you guy- said that like 
on camera or oh, in yes. front of a live oh, audience he, and so I on? Did. Oh, I did. I did. Yeah. Just like that and, episode of South Park where they revealed yes. John Edward like right <laughs> in front of his audience. Wow. Be, right. Yeah. yeah. No, I did. <laughs> and and everyone in the room got mad at me. Like, you know, you're the spoil sport here. And it's like, yeah, but he's just making stuff up. And, you know, I pointed out, for example, for every guy in the room, he said, I'm getting something about the watch. If, 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 the, if the male had lost a father figure, father, grandfather, whatever. And mm -hmm. I, it, I lost my father. I still have my dad's watch. And I thought, oh, I bet this is true for most guys. They keep their dad's watch. And women keep their mother's jewelry, whatever, something like that. And uh, it turns out that's true. <laughs> that's one of the kind of gold standards of cold reading, you know, that, that'll be true for almost everybody. And as, uh, as, John, as John Edward says, where's the cancer connection? <laughs> what are the odds right. that there's no cancer yes. connection right, right in your family or something like that? I'm getting something about the chest area or the head area. Yeah. It's yeah. never about the well, foot or the knee. <laughs> well, and also, but you make a good point. It's often a disjunctive set, right? So they can be right. Like they have given themselves three or four ways to be right, but they say them so fast. That right. By the time someone says, oh yeah, bone cancer, nobody remembers the other things they said beforehand that sort of gets washed out by the rapid fire banter of it all, you know, or, and we uh, and, and it might be entertaining to, to to you know some potential readers in the book we actually transcribed a John Edward psychic reading and sort of analyzed it after the after the fact and and you can see how if you actually pay attention to everything he said you'll see that there's nothing all that surprising about it but if you only pay attention to the things that had a payoff which is what he constantly follows up on and so on well then it looks like there's a brilliant you know a brilliant investigation discovering you know discovering uh, some hidden fact yeah I did another I don't think the ethics are I, I think the ethics are I mean, I think you should either explicitly do it for entertainment or, or, or not do it because well, they, I think the ethics are pretty bad when you're, when you're actually claiming to be sending messages from people that people care about or people who may still be alive even, right? There's a Sylvia Brown case where she yeah. said, your daughter is dead and I see her, I see her lying in water or something like that. It turned out she was alive and had been kidnapped. The horrible um, case. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. Well, this is why magicians don't like Uri Geller, because they know he's doing magic. He knows he's doing magic. He can't be self-deceived. I mean, to prepare spoons to bend, there's an actual technique. It's not just like, I've convinced myself I'm doing this, you know, mentally, because at some point you actually have to touch the spoon or the fork to make it bend. And that's what irritates them about it. Darren Brown, you know, he's just using really clever techniques, and he's not claiming that he's doing some psychic thing that's you know real magic he's not claiming anything so magicians like yeah that's totally cool yeah i think that's i, th I think that's right I, I find i find darren brown quite entertaining especially the way he's he's one of those magicians i think who is fairly open about taking ideas from behavioral science and using them in magic playing on them you know and so on which certainly makes it more entertaining for a person like me uh and being able to see how he sort of exploits those kinds of effects that that have been studied so much like survivor bias you know and, and survivorship bias and so on in his in his act uh, i find it quite entertaining i wrote one of my scientific american columns called the houdini principle before you say something is out of this world first make sure that it's not in this world so uh, this this is uh, from <laughs> one of the great biographies of of houdini in april 1922 <laughs> sir arthur conan doyle visited houdini in his home now, they were friends. Arthur Conan Doyle at the time was really big into the whole theosophical spiritualism movement. He lost one of his sons in the First World War and was convinced that he could talk to his son on the other side and so on. So he was very uh, susceptible to that stuff. Anyway, um, whereupon the magician set out to demonstrate that slate writing, a favorite method among mediums for receiving messages from the dead who allegedly move a piece of chalk across a slate, could be done by perfectly prosaic means. Houdini had Conan Doyle hang a slate from anywhere in the room so that it was free to swing in space. He presented the author with four cork balls, asking him to pick one and cut it open to prove that it had not been altered. He then had Conan Doyle pick another ball and dip it into a well of white ink. While it was soaking, Houdini asked his visitor to leave the house and go down the street in any direction, take out a piece of paper and pencil and write down a question or a sentence, bring it back, put it back in his pocket and return to the house. Conan Doyle uh, complied scribbling, many, many tekel up arson, a mysterious riddle from the Bible's book of Daniel, meaning it has been counted and counted, weighed and divided. Uh, then Houdini had him scoop up the ink-soaked cork ball in a spoon and place it against the slate, where it momentarily stuck before slowly rolling out across the face, spelling out M and then E and E and so forth till the 
entire phase was, uh, phrase was completed, at which point the ball dropped to the ground. According to Houdini's biographers, William Kalush and Larry Sloman, who this is their kind of definitive biography of Houdini, uh, this is what Houdini told them. Sir Arthur, I have devoted a lot of time and thought to this illusion. I won't tell you how it was done, but I can assure you it was done by pure trickery. I did it by perfectly normal means. I devised it to show you what can be done along these lines. I beg of you, Sir Arthur, do not jump to the conclusion that certain things you see are necessarily supernatural or the work of spirits just because you can't explain them. I have given you this test to impress upon you the necessity of cautions, and I sincerely hope you will profit by it. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> <laughs> did it Did it work? Uh, I don't know. I think he died still thinking you know, there was something to the spiritualism movement and, and so on. You know, Conan Doyle was also into the whole fairies, those little fairies that were fake photos. And, you know, at the bottom of the garden, there's these little fairies. And there's a great movie about this. Harvey Keitel plays Houdini. And I forget who plays Conan Doyle. But, you know, but the movie, uh, it's called, um, oh, shoot, I forget the name of this film. But it, 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 it you know, kind of portrayed all this stuff. And I think the the power of a personal experience like that, particularly if you're motivated, if you've lost somebody like a son, uh, almost impossible for rationality to kind of override those emotions. Yeah, I think there, there's a lot to that, and uh, in the case of in, in in the case of being in, in the case of being fooled, I think um, you know a, a large element is a large element is the value that we place on what we have personally experienced um, or things that are very personally relevant to us and. A really good con artist, I think, knows that and tries to set up those experiences uh, and especially tries to give people exactly what they're expecting, exactly what they're predicting. Uh, and that's an element. I mean, if, although they're not necessarily, of course, they're, they're not Houdini, they're not, you know, they're not great magicians and so on. I think in some ways they use that same principle of um, giving people an extremely powerful personal experience. And another interesting thing they do, which is related, is uh, sometimes they will deliberately make a mistake, right? And then admit that they made a mistake, which gives more credibility to everything else that they're, mm. that they're saying. So even John Edward will say, mm -hmm. you know, well, sometimes things come through. I don't know what they're, you know, so he, it's, all, it, it, it's all part of the same, um, it, it's all part of the same process. Uh, it's in a lot of the kinds of things we talk about in the book, it, it's not... Um, uh, we're, we're talking about sort of more everyday kinds of scams and cons and, and, and frauds, um, not necessarily, uh, you know, grand illusions, right? Um, uh, and the ones we talk about most, I think, operate in a more simple way. You don't necessarily need to have that kind of personal emotional response um, for, for those things to, um, for those things to work. Yeah, I saw Edwards do a, a really clever technique I hadn't seen before. You know, it, the, the people are doing the readings, not the psychic. You know, I, I'm getting something about a red dress. What does this mean? Now, 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 you have to clarify what this means for me. You tell us. And then sometimes you see the people sitting there going, I don't really know what this means. And he, don't make me come out there. And, okay, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, I'll think of something, <laughs> right? And also, you know, there you, you know, the cameras are rolling and the, you know, the whole atmosphere. It's like the, the Peter Popoff stuff when Randy exposed Popoff as a con. You know, one of the cons was you have wheelchairs waiting for the people to come in and some little old lady walks in. She's got a walker or a cane or something. She's moving kind of slow. Ma'am, would you like to sit? Would you like to sit in the front row? We'll we'll put you right here in this wheelchair. Yes, thank you. And they roll her down in the front row. You know, two hours later, the cameras, the lights, the music, and he comes to her. I want you to get out of that chair right now. Jesus <laughs> wants you to walk again. Now stand up. And she stands up, and everybody's like, "Oh my God, she, you know, she could walk." And now at that moment, why doesn't she say, "Hang on, hang on, everybody. I could already walk." She's not going to do that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly that. The in these theatrical things, right? The audience often wants to collaborate with the, with the performer. You don't want to, that's what you sort of came for and everybody plays along. It's, it's sort of a form of suggestibility also perhaps mm -hmm. as, as well. That's, a, that, that, that's involved in a lot of these in a lot of these kinds of kinds of performances in, in our framework, I guess what we would, uh, you know, one, one thing we would say is one reason why that deception works on the audience is that when you see someone in a wheelchair, you create a, a belief an assumption that, they're in a wheelchair because they can't walk. That seems to be why a lot of people are in wheelchairs or that they were in a wheelchair when they came in, right? A lot of people who are in wheelchairs in theaters were in wheelchairs when they came in. So 
the performer in this case is exploiting what he knows are our likely assumptions and and beliefs and commitments in order to create that in order to create that effect right so there it fits exactly into our you know in, 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 into our framework the performer is just thinking ahead to what the audience is going to assume and then playing off of that i don't know if you ever saw the steve martin film uh, leap of faith uh, but uh, he plays a faith healer like this and th they show all the tricks like 20 different tricks that he's a total con man in the in the in the film but at the end the kid you know, has this miracle and he can walk again. It's like, oh, why do they have to end the movie like this? <laughs> <laughs> I well, guess to get every so <laughs> often someone recovers from a That's disease right. or a disorder, right? You come out of a coma that was that was on for ten years or something like that. Like natural natural recovery happens sometimes. There's. That's true. Yeah, that that's absolutely right. So you can't. Would have been nice if there was a little like textual thing at the end. You know, please note right. that sometimes people recover spontaneously from <laughs> right. serious illnesses. <laughs> right. But the power of personal experiences like that, you talk about that in the book, like with alien abductions. I've met a lot of these abductees. I believe that they really had a, an experience. They're not just making it up. And it's a little bit like I met uh, Eben Alexander in, a, in the green room of this TV show. He's the guy that wrote uh, the, uh, Proof of Heaven. And he had an NDE when he was in a, a coma. And, you know, he had this virus that inflamed his brain and they had to put him in an induced coma and so on. And when they brought him out, he had this incredible experience of going to heaven. So the book is about that. And, you know, he's a, a Harvard-trained neurologist. He knows more about the brain than I do. He knows everything I know about the causes of NDEs and out-of-body experiences and so on. And yet he just said, but Michael, I mean, you just can't believe what a powerful experience it was. I mean, the colors, the sounds, the beauty, the, the emotional sense of the whole experience, like, okay. You know, it's like, right, but what do you do with that? I get, I, 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 I'm heard of that book and I've heard of him. I don't know any more about it than what you just told me, really, but... I feel like dreams are also powerful experiences and we have them almost every night. And when you're in them, they seem incredibly real and so on. But few people, especially neurologists, would wake up after a dream and say, well, this means that, I don't know, whatever you would say about it, but certainly dreams are, 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 that, are, are that strange. Yeah, I think, um, I think that we, well, I guess my personal view is the, the burden of proof ought to be on someone to disprove that ordinary understood entities and concepts can explain what's going on. So with the alien abductions, um, I don't know who originated this explanation, but I've seen it many times that um, sleep paralysis combined with, um, uh, you know, certain, certain kinds of um, uh, visual experiences and so on can easily be interpreted once you have the framework of aliens who paralyze you and take you out of your bed and, and, and do surgery on you and so on can easily be interpreted in that, uh, in that way. Uh, that to me is a great, a great example of, of devising a perfectly good explanation. And we didn't necessarily know that explanation before, but you know, it's not the job of science to come up with, uh, uh, you know, an explanation for every experience that hasn't yet been had, but once the experience has been had, then we should sort of privilege. I do think we should privilege that, that, type of explanation. I'm not saying anything super controversial on this show, I suppose, but mm -hmm. but I think some people think, well, why why would you why would you privilege one over the other? And I suppose I would say because the one has has worked in so many other cases and has, you know, sort of proven its ability over and over again, whereas the other doesn't seem to yield anything that we can really rely on. Um but that's yeah, it's hard, you know, that's it's a pretty know. pretty basic view of things. Right. How to test it, you know, so if you say, well, there's this alternative world out there, I'd say, okay, how can, can I see it? Well, if you take this ayahuasca or this magic mushrooms or whatever, you'll see it. Like, okay, so let's say I do that. I go, oh my God, you're right. The, the colors, the, you know, the, the sounds, it was incredible. I saw these creatures, spirit entities, and so on. And then I come back and I tell you, hey, you're not going to believe this. And you go, all right, Shermer, prove it. I go, well, take this ayahuasca. You'll see for yourself. At some point, we're in this loop. <laughs> like, can I see this without the ayahuasca? No. Yeah. All right, yeah. then, then what? <laughs> Yeah, how do we, it's, it's sort of like, uh, uh, yeah, I, what was the cause of it? Does it really exist or is it, is it produced by the, you know, is it, is it produced by the, by the, uh, by the drug, by the drug itself? I think often there are sort of more subtle causal factors that we don't necessarily think about uh, that, that are going on here as well, like the commonalities in alien abduction experiences, right? Mm -hmm. that, you know, that I think a lot of people took, would take that as strong evidence that these experiences must be real because supposedly these independent people are reporting that the same kind of creatures abducted them and took them to the same kind of place and did the same kind of stuff with their bodies. But 
as you know, and as we mentioned in the book, it turns out that that story only started happening once there were similar TV shows and movies on. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly that story started happening as though the aliens got the idea from TV and then started doing it, you know, and started doing it, (laughs) which makes no sense at all, right? That would be uncanny timing on the part of the... On, on the part of the uh, although we do think part that of the aliens. well the sleep paralysis explanation is probably the right one uh but that's probably been going on for a long time because you can read these accounts in the middle ages and the early modern period of people thinking these incubi and succubi were doing these things so the culture tells you what to call the experience yeah. and how to describe it yeah c- kind of like um delusions and schizophrenia right they're very culturally specific a lot of people in the u.s think the cia is doing stuff to them but nobody in no nobody in 15th century africa would have had that belief of course yeah all right, let's talk about scientific fraud and academic fraud and so on. I, I, I find the whole uh, replication crisis thing uh, just really upsetting because, you know, this is always our go-to thing to the pseudoscientists. Well, if you could just, you know, get published in a peer-reviewed journal, <laughs> you know, then we would accept it. And then, you know, like the BEM experiment comes out of the backward causality. All, this. all right, Shermer, this was published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology by B- Daryl BEM, a world-class scientist. Now, what do you say? It's like, Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I think I think that's a reason why, as that science needs to police this kind of thing more strongly internally, because every time this kind of thing happens, it erodes our collective reputation and our collective ability to to point to our social conventions and and so on as a uh, mostly truth generating machine. Of course, it doesn't work all the time. Oftentimes. Things have to be revised and theories are improved over time and so on. But when when someone is able to publish fraudulent studies, like literally fraudulent studies, and to do it over and over again, like the, the top guy on retraction watch is like close to 200 retracted papers by now. I haven't got my name on 200 papers in my whole life, let alone 200 <laughs> fraudulent ones. It doesn't do well for our reputation. And, and it, within certain areas of science, there is live debate over, are we going too far? in pointing out fraud and pointing at the people, naming the people who seem to be responsible for it and, and so on. And, and of course, I don't believe that we should just be willy-nilly calling people frauds unless there's really strong evidence. But when that evidence is there, we need to, you know, we, we need to be pretty explicit about it. And um, I, I have thought that you know, tenure should be revoked in some of these cases. I mean, tenure is really important, I think, in, in academia and on balance a good thing, but not when you're publishing fraudulent claims. Like that might be one of the, the times when tenure shouldn't protect you any longer. Um, I, I think it's a real, you know, it's a real cancer. Uh, well, real cancer seems weird. It's, literal, it's not literal cancer, but it's a it's a real metaphorical cancer on mm-hmm. Uh, the the public value of science to 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 have so much fraud going on, and I don't know that the, what I don't know what the percentage of fraud is. It's probably pretty low, just like the percentage of time that people are explicitly lying to you when they tell you something is probably very low. Um, but it's obviously gotten high enough, and it it was higher than we realized, um, and and needs to be brought under uh, better control. We we have a lot of, and I think you know to get to sort of more to the point of of what we say about it in the book. Um, it's a paradox, I think, for a lot of people because scientists are supposed to be critical thinkers, supposed to be skeptics, supposed to be people who value truth over other things and and so on. But yet the way that scientific con artists work is they they don't publish outrageous claims. If they do, they won't last long because then they will attract a lot of attention. People will try to replicate it and fail, and it'll become pretty clear what was going on. But they publish things that are close enough to to the you know to the truth and 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 are, are what was predicted by existing theories and schools of thought just enough that everybody applauds the fake results instead of scrutinizing them. Again, it's sort of like the, the, the it's, it's like the fine line of what is the signal? Like when, when something happens that you expect, you know, someone publishes a new paper showing something new and you expected that to happen because it's very consistent with your theory. Should you be more skeptical or should you be less skeptical? I think in science, we probably should be more skeptical because we're already inherently skeptical about the crazy stuff. We need to be more skeptical about the somewhat unsurprising things. Uh, and and I even think there should be an independent, there should be independent organizations whose goals, whose goals are to scrutinize scientific literature, scientific papers, scientific claims more deeply, because the peer review process is not a grand jury investigation. People might think it's like that. It's, it's not. Um, most reviewers don't read the act, don't look at the actual data. 
Um, they have widely varying levels of scrutiny and rigor that they will apply to reviewing a paper. Uh, and it's better to have that than to not have it, but clearly there needs to be, I think, more follow-up other than by just people who sort of do it as their hobby because they care. Um, there needs to be some more institutionalized way mm -hmm. of that happening. Remember I brought in uh, Danny Kahneman in, uh, to my Caltech lecture series, science lecture series, uh, when his book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, came out, what was that, 2011, I think, right as the replication crisis was starting to uh, kind of be revealed. So he starts talking about the prime, some of the priming experiments, and then he pauses and says, assuming anyone actually did this research. <laughs> and it was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> wow, I hadn't, I hadn't heard that one before. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, he, he did, in his book, he did have a whole chapter about these experiments, yeah. which... Um, I, 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 by the way, I reviewed, I love, I love that book. I used it in teaching my own judgment and decision-making class because I found it much more accessible for students than a typical textbook. It's very nicely written. Um, and I reviewed it for the Wall Street Journal very positively when it came out. But I think that chapter didn't need to be in the book because I actually don't think that much of the rest of the book depends on these very subtle unconscious priming claims from things in our environment drastically altering our behavior. I don't think anything else really rides on it in in most of Danny and Amos Tversky's and everybody else's framework on judgment and decision making. And, and he was rather early to recognize after he published the book that this area of research was in trouble and was urging the, the people who actually make their living in that area, or at least that's their primary research focus, to try to do something about replication. And it's okay, I think, if people accidentally produce effects that are unreplicable and so on. But what's less okay is when they respond to calls for replication and uh, attempts to replicate their work with dismissal and with sort of what you might call sophistry about whether replication really matters in science. As far as I know, when we're doing science in third grade, we're replicating things that have been done for centuries and doing that to uh, not just prove that science keeps on working, but partly to illustrate that the way science works is it gives you general enough rules and laws and principles that you can apply them again over and over again and, in fact, build rockets and TVs and cell phones and so on based on them. So the idea that somehow in certain areas of behavioral science or psychology, replication is not important or outdated, I think was a really bad move um, to make by, by some people. And I, I think that that is changing over time. I think that uh, mostly, largely in a generational way, as a lot of things change about attitudes and so on, right? The younger generation is more committed to openness, replication, uh, and uh, maybe less committed to telling a great story with your, with your experiments, mm. although that still obviously captivates people if there's a good story more so than if there's not. Well, yeah, I guess one of the lessons is that if it sounds kind of cutesy and you know just a single causal vector explains this huge thing you know like at the ted i was at the ted conference where amy cuddy gave her you know power pose talk that's been seen i don't know 50 million people have watched this thing you know and afterwards everyone's walking around with their shoulders back and their chin up like oh yeah i got my power pose going on here <laughs> and i guess that failed to replicate right and and uh but you know could could really being successful in business come down to this one thing if i just have the power pose i'll get the raise when i go in or so that just on the face of it, it's just it's like that just can't be that simple, or like well, the decline the decline of violence, you know that that the, the freakonomics explanation. Oh, Roe v. Wade explains this whole thing, or lead in the water explains violence. Or, you know, nothing in human behavior is caused by one thing like that. Sure, yeah, that's an, a great example. I just saw on, on Twitter so a few tweets about how when uh, salt was decreased in different kinds of food their rates of stroke went down dramatically. And I saw that and I was like, wow, I should probably have less salt. But of course, I almost immediately had the thought, wait a minute, these are sort of two or three anecdotes in different countries in different years and so on. Is that really a good causal story? I have not gone and looked at the randomized controlled trials involving salt, but I did become more sensitive to the salt labels on, on food. And obviously, salt's not the only thing that causes strokes, but maybe it could make, you know, it could have a significant impact. As far as power posing goes, I think the story is a little a little bit more interesting than that it didn't replicate because although the original paper was was based on a very small sample of subjects and the first author of that original paper has essentially disavowed the results, um, 
I think the story was a little bit more complicated because I think one reason why people found the idea of power posing so persuasive was that the researchers had measured a couple of different consequences of power posing. One was, did you feel more powerful, right? Sort of like these social psychologists have these scales for measuring things, like how powerful do you feel? And they have various questions they ask you, right? And, and that went up, right? So you feel more powerful after you pose like a superhero or in these expansive body postures. But there were two other things they, and, and they also measured, uh, I believe, how much risk people were willing to take in a simple gambling game, a laboratory gambling game, and that went up also. And then there was cortisol and testosterone. And cortisol, according to the results, went down and testosterone went up. Now, if you've got all four of those things moving in concert, right, that's an incredible consistency across four variables. And the most persuasive ones, I think, were the, the physiological ones. Like testosterone goes up if you pose like this for two minutes, like that must be real. People published critiques uh, from the endocrinology point of view almost immediately saying testosterone doesn't really work this way. Like you shouldn't have an increase in, in testosterone so quickly after doing this and it shouldn't be measurable in this way. And, and, and those things didn't replicate. But what does replicate apparently is that people do often report feeling more powerful after they pose that way. And then the question becomes, well, is that some kind of expectation or demand effect? Like if you pose like Superman, wouldn't you feel a little more powerful? Is that that surprising? Does it really make you any better at your job or more likely to get the job or, you know, more convincing and so on? So it, it was, I think part of the reason why that one caused so much controversy aside from the popularity of the TED Talk was that it was a, it was a, um, a very convincing story based on all these different factors and it was hard for people to, I think, unbelieve that. It seemed like such, it wasn't just like a rating scale, they feel more powerful, right? But physiology, testosterone, that's something we ought to, you know, we ought to be able to take seriously. It's a really, inter it's a really interesting story, but I think ultimately I, I still do not power pose before I give a talk or go on a mm. podcast. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to power pose for me. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but it, but it does kind of bring up the whole thing, brings up this issue of trust in science and scientific institutions, which have really been under assault under after COVID-19. And, you know, can you really trust Anthony Fauci? Hey, they lied about masks and they said that the vaccine would prevent the spread and it didn't. They lied about this. They lied about that or whatever. You can't trust these these experts. Uh, I watched the whole three hours of RFK Jr. on Rogan. And interestingly, you know, he has this whole, you can't trust peer review and the experts aren't what they are and, you know, they, this and that and so on. And then Joe asked him about climate change. Oh, the consensus is right. The, the jury is in. The experts are absolutely, hundred. you know, and we know this is true. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> like you said, you can't trust the experts. Okay. So people seem to pick and choose their battles, but the, the whole vaccine thing and the mass and all that, it's just, it just seems in some circles anyway, no one trusts scientific institutions. I, well, yes, although I think, again, there's one of the interesting things about COVID, I think, is it there, there's some easy science to distrust because you don't need to trust it in order to go about life. Um, whether the theory of evolution is true or not, it doesn't really affect even yeah. what medications are going to be prescribed by your doctor or whatever, let alone, you know, whatever, anything else that happens in, in your day. Um, COVID was a little bit different because I think you did have these cases of people sort of disbelieving it to the extent that it caused them not to get vaccinated or it caused them to not go to the hospital in time or it caused them to not even believe they had COVID and, when they were in the hospital. And, and so on. that's an interesting phenomenon. I wish I had a great explanation for that beyond the normal polarization and, you know, and, and ideology examples and uh, and so on. But but I think that the the answer to very often we can't trust the experts is something people say in retrospect because the experts might have been wrong about something. But at the time the experts are opining during a public health crisis, should you just trust yourself? Like, I don't think that is very rational to think that anyone, even if Fauci makes mistakes, even if the CDC gets things wrong occasionally, if I just had to pick one or the other, myself or my friends on online versus them, I would still have to pick them because they're more likely to be right than I am and my friends online. And I don't have a good method for discriminating between the times they're wrong and they're right. Over time, we might learn more about when they're likely to be wrong and right about a particular topic. And certainly in retrospect, we can see that. Um, my friend, Dan Willingham, who's a great author, he writes a lot about cognitive science and education. He told me years ago, he was writing a book called, When Can You Trust the Experts? 
And I said, oh, that's a really interesting topic. Like, I would love to know more about that. And and I, I said, uh, what are you going to say about uh, climate change and, and things like that? And he said, oh, well, in all of those areas, I would just say trust the National Academy of Sciences. Whatever whatever they put in their reports, like, you, you have no basis for deciding anything else unless you're already an expert. So his book, When Should You Trust the Experts, is about when you should trust the experts when they opine about education, educational policies, because the experts uh, in, in that domain are not necessarily backed by a lot of good quality science and good quality scientific consensus, like the experts in climate change or uh, environmental science or medicine or something like that would be. Does he mean uh, that they're ideologically captured uh, rather than data driven? I don't know if he would. Well, this this book is maybe 10 years old now or something like that. So I don't want to say like whether he still believes it or what's in it. Um, but I think it's not so much ideological, like left, right ideological, but there are a lot of um, faddish things that happen in education, I can say. For example, mindset, you know, the the idea that mindset is all important, certainly swept through education and you know, kids, kids whose ages are in the single digits are being taught about mindset and how important it is and how to have, you know, the right mindset and the, why you shouldn't have the wrong mindset. And it took a long time for large randomized trials to catch up and find out that the, you know, the effect of mindset training on educational outcomes is, is minuscule. And, mm. um, if anything, uh, so I think it would be more sort of like those kinds of things. Learning styles mm. is another example, right? Everybody get into learning styles and so on. It's a good story, but there's really no good data from cognitive science that tells you that, you know, if, if, if we test you with a questionnaire and you test as a verbal learner and I test as a spatial learner, there's no evidence that presenting material to you in a different form from presenting it to me will actually on net increase our learning. Probably the way material should be presented is the way it's the most natural for that form. So uh, geometry should still be presented spatially and algebra <laughs> still verbally, you know, it, um, and, uh, that, you know, well, the fact so that you prefer words and I prefer pictures doesn't necessarily mean I should, yeah. be, we should be catered to in that way to improve our learning outcomes. It was a lot of this kind of stuff, right? Where the experts may not be basing their opinions on really, you, you know, good uh, data or logic. And, and I suppose Dan would say, if, when it comes to climate change, go with the NAS. I don't have any reason to, to trust what they distrust, what they're saying. There you're talking about like fads in education or like the self-esteem yeah. movement in the 90s, you know, or 80s. Sure. <laughs> Give everybody a trophy and it turns out the data shows it doesn't do anything. Um, yeah, so again on these, you know, who to trust. So your truth bias or truth default would say most of the time, most scientists get it right and they're trying to do the right thing. They're not trying to lie and so on. Most scientific institutions are reasonably trustworthy. You know, the consensus is a reasonable rational thing to follow. They might be wrong, but probably not. Sort of in a sort of a Bayesian way, you know, 97% of climate scientists say X, global warming is real and human caused. They're probably right. They might be wrong. The 3% might be right, but unlikely. Yeah. I mean, probably 1.3% said the earth was round and 97% said it was flat, right? And the, the rounders won in the end. <laughs> um, now it's probably more than 3% say it's flat, but still, you know, yeah. they, they're not the experts, right? That's not the expert consensus, right? Um, yeah, I think um, th there there are some things you can you can look at to give yourself some idea whether the experts are wrong or whether scientists are wrong because there are some things that fraudulent data have in common, right? They are usually not noisy enough in certain senses. Um, they, uh, you know, people trying to forge clinical trials will often make the control group and the placebo group look too similar on every different thing you measure them on, like age, sex, uh, educational attainment, severity of disease, all those kinds of things you might want to balance them out on, they'll make the balance too perfect. So you know that something has been done because it's uh, it's all too consistent to be be true over and over again. But the, I think the average person should be attentive to those kinds of things, but they don't necessarily, they aren't necessarily equipped to sort of look at, you know, the clinical trials that have been published for COVID vaccines, just to pick a topical example, and um, obviously spot what's wrong with them. That's the kind of work that you know that experts might be able might be able to do, and that intelligent individuals certainly can participate in. But it's you still wouldn't, you know, I, I think we still wouldn't want to advise someone without a little bit of investigation to just say, oh well, this 
you know, this science has got to be wrong and this science is, but this, all these other sciences are okay. The ones that I rely on for driving to, you know, for driving <laughs> to work and, uh, you know, and heating my house and so on. Right. Um, following up on that, uh, RFK, uh, episode with Joe Rogan and then Rogan offered a hundred thousand bucks for Peter Hotez to come on and debate RFK. And then it's up to like over $2 million. Now he still won't do it. Why won't he do it? I don't want to pl give a platform to, to RFK. He already has a platform. He's running for well, president. Well, he's got one already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, why not just give him, you know, just here's the argument, here's the refutation, here's the argument, and let him just go through them. I mean, you'd have to prepare. It's not enough to be a vaccine expert or an epidemiologist. You have to know exactly what he's going to argue. But he's done this so much, it's all out there. You know, because he'll come up with, you know, don't, don't you remember that study back in 1976 published in this journal that found, do, 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 and if you don't know that, then, you know, you look like you're unprepared. Um, so there's a risk there. Do you think that there would be some value in a public display like that, where the undecided voters, so to speak, like, yeah, I don't know if I trust the CDC and Fauci, all this stuff. What's the story here? Then they hear Kennedy make his case. They hear Hotez make his case. And they go, oh, okay, now I know. I, I don't know Peter Hotez at all, aside from having heard his name in connection with the, with this debate, or this debate about the debate, this meta debate. Um, yeah. But I am recall I, I am I, I am reminded of the uh, Ross Perot Al Gore mm. debate on um, free trade. Uh, specifically, it was about the NAFTA free trade agreement, which was on I believe the Larry King show back in the '90s, the early part of the Clinton administration. And uh, I don't think we heard much from Al uh, from uh, Ross Perot after after that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the consensus is that that it was a smart move politically, at least, for Al Gore to appear on. TV alongside the biggest critic of uh, at that time of of the um, of the treaty and that that he won the debate. But how do you win a debate? Do you win it by actually? I, I mean, do you win it by actually disproving in a logical way the other side's arguments? And certainly, he made counter arguments, as I recall. But but also, he's an articulate figure. He's smart. Uh, he you know probably won the debate in part by making Ross Perot look a little weird and manic and you know, and so on. And that's a whole different thing from like what's scientifically mm. correct, right? You can win a debate and be wrong. Like those intelligent squared debates that they have, I think a lot of times the wrong side wins because the audience is more convinced by their arguments. It's not, there's this sort of, I think, you know, I, I think they're interesting and they can be enlightening and they sound good, but, but I don't recall any scientific questions that were really actually solved by debate. That's kind of not how, not, not how science works. And and uh, I don't I don't buy the platforming argument, but I, I do buy the idea that if you're going up against a politician, smart and articulate one, who's been basically coming up with these arguments for years, decades, right? Who could you put up who would appear as convincing right. and as sure right. of themselves? Like a lot of times people are swayed by confidence and swayed by the rapidity with which people can can speak and appear to recall facts and so on. Those are all sort of social perceptions more so than truth. So if you're going to do the debate, your your champion has got to be the best possible person to do it. I have no idea whether Peter Hotez is. I don't know yeah. the first thing about him. I don't know who would be the right person to do it. Um, but I don't think reluctance to debate in that format should be interpreted as a sign of weakness, I guess. Certainly, certainly not. And there are plenty of uh, rebuttal videos and articles online that do exactly what I just proposed. It's just that they have small readerships and viewerships compared to Rogan's you know, 10, 20, 30 million that would watch that. So I suppose yeah. that's the difference. Kennedy, you know, I've been studying him now for a while since he announced, and he's a pretty compelling figure. You know, he's got the Kennedy name, and even though he's got the weird voice thing that he lost his voice, he, he still speaks in a way that that is very moving. And he starts off kind of reasonable. He, you know, tobacco, the tobacco industry captured the regulatory state there. Look, they lied to us about, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They did. And, you know, big pharma, like what Purdue Pharmaceutical, they lied about the OPA. Oh, yeah, that's right. They did. You know, and then and then half an hour later and the CIA killed my uncle and my father and the, you know, the and military industrial complex is controlling Joe Biden and we got to get out of Ukraine. It's like, holy shit, hang on here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, or even even worse, uh, COVID and or COVID vaccines are biologically targeted at people of certain ethnicities and and so on. I, I mean, if you a lot of people I've, I've heard a lot of people say, well, he says reasonable things about X. But I think if you hold if you look at the totality of all the things like. You sort of get to that stopped clock metaphor at some point. Um, mm, right, uh, and that's right. Again, right. I'm not an expert on not not an expert on on uh, RFK Jr. But 
um, having been somewhat familiar with some of what he says about he's been saying about vaccines for ages, I, uh, I'm, 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 I'm skeptical. And uh, yeah. but yeah. I think he found you know I, I think if he, if he was ever planning to run for president, being the the country's biggest vaccine skeptic, he found the right time, yes. right? Because yeah, right, probably yeah. right now right. is that you know and and again you know, play to the expectations, right? There's a much bigger audience now that is vaccine skeptical than yes. there ever was before. So if he wanted his constituency, he he managed to wait until they were there ready, you know, ready for him. I think what bothers me most about it is that, you know, he says, I just want, I, I just want somebody to answer my questions. I'm just asking questions that, you know, that, well, they have, you know, Mr. Kennedy, you have been responded to over and over and oh, we did it in skeptic, you know, there's hundreds of videos and are, you don't respond to those. How come? You know, it's the same thing I told David Irving, you know, but, you know, I just have some questions about the Holocaust and Auschwitz and, you know, Birkenau and the, you know, crematoria too. There's no holes in the roof of the, you know, the gas chamber. And so how do you explain these? And you explain it to him and he, and he just ignores it and just continues to repeat it. And it's like, OK, you're not an honest actor here, you know, in a in a conference. But maybe this is the difference between a scientist and a lawyer. Is the a lawyer's job? Kennedy's a lawyer. Is to win your case, not to figure out what's true. Yeah, and and, and winning winning the case in many cases is essentially a social process, and that you need to convince enough people to to vote one way or the other. Essentially, whether it's out of twelve or six or uh, you know or or, or whatever. Um, I think in the legal framework, it's a little harder to get away with complete nonsense mm -hmm. um, than than in the than in the public arena but the, the also the, the, there's sort of like a there's a logical asymmetry in that whole argument well if, if your theory can't explain this thing then it can't explain anything mm -hmm. um but that you know it, it, your argument can fail to explain a few things and still be much more plausible and consistent with the totality of the evidence than some you know other theory right but the idea is that like you know if your theory falls then mine is the only one left and must fill the vacuum and be accepted as a sort of a faulty, you know, a, a faulty element of logic in, in those, in those cases as well. All right, Christopher, I want to be mindful of your time. Just a couple uh, final big questions. I, I had uh, Hugo Mercy on the show, his book, Not Born Yesterday. He's kind of skeptical of the truth default. He says, um, like examples, advertisements rarely work on people. You can't just tell people do, do this. They don't buy it or political campaigns and, and, so on are, are very ineffective uh, and that people, most people are not mass persuaded quite so easily. I don't know if you, how familiar you are with his arguments on that. Um, well, I'm, I'm familiar generally with their view and, and it's his previous book with, um, with Dan Sperber as well. Yeah. I'm familiar yeah. generally with you. In fact, we cite one of their um, nice experiments in our, uh, in, mm. in nobody's fool as well. Uh, and I have a lot of sympathy for it, but I'm not sure that the truth bias concept at least the way we see it means you automatically believe everything you hear. Mm. It, it more believes it, it more it, and, and act upon it. Right. And it, it more believes that in the absence of uh, any immediate contradiction or immediate reason to disbelieve or the chance to study it, you temporarily tag it as true. So why don't we respond to all the advertisements we see? Well, because you can think that they're true and not necessarily act on them, or you can, um, you, you can accept the claims are true temporarily and then shortly after that realize I've actually just been watching an advertisement. They have self-interest. You know, they want me to buy stuff. I won't really believe it. Or it's possible to hear an advertisement over and over again that although you might not believe the advertisement when you hear it, the familiarity causes you simply to remember the contents of the advertisement more. And that then sways you when it comes time to buy your next car or your next can of soda or or whatever it might be. So I think there's a difference between the idea of a truth bias and the idea that everything you see immediately controls your, your behavior and response. Um, same with politicians. I think repetition, which we also talk about is, is very important. Um, the, uh, the old movie, the candidate with Robert Redford um, from 1972 or 73, I believe, you know, it has a very memorable scene that I remember ever since seeing this movie in high school um, where Robert Redford, becomes a reluctant politician. And after trying to campaign his way, he realizes that he has to campaign the way his old handlers want him to, which is basically giving the same speech and the same slogans over and over again, as many times a day as he can, zooming back and forth across California until it drives him nuts. And he sort of 
starts babbling in the back of his car. Well, that's the kind of thing that maybe has more of an effect is just the repetition of message as opposed to everyone will just believe it the first time they hear it and then we'll, we'll move on. Um, so I don't really know their specific arguments about truth bias, but I think there's a world where um, I, I think it, there, there are logical arguments for why some form of truth bias is, is almost required in order to just have a, an interaction with other people. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have to go as far as just believing every advertisement and politician. you hear. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I think it's too simple to say, you know, are we naturally gullible or naturally skeptical? Or are we rational or irrational? It's too simple. Obviously, it's very context dependent and so on, which is what we've been talking about this whole time. What does it take to get somebody to take their clothes off or get the checkbook out or whatever? <laughs> so final question. So what what um, what do you recommend you know, sort of the end of your book? You know, like what should I be looking out for? What should you be looking out for? Uh, well, you mean in terms of scams? Like what's, yeah, yeah, what, yeah, what, yeah. I, I don't want to be fooled. <laughs> yeah, well, I think um, uh, I, I guess one, way, one place to end the conversation might be that, you know, right as we're finishing the book, um, chatbots sort of, I don't want to say necessarily they got better at anything. They got better at chatting. That's for sure. Like whether they got better at giving accurate answers, I'm not so sure. I think people are, people have been in a sense taken in by ChatGPT and some other language models. Um, and they produce such fluent stuff that they can easily convince us that they are also accurate. Um, and I think uh, don't be taken in by you know claims about AI models being intelligent, especially not generally intelligent, despite what people might say. Um, in a way, what language models do inherently in constructing output is they give you the next token, which is most likely to happen, according to a very super sophisticated statistical analysis of, you know, much of what has been said, you know, by by other people and and so on. And, and that's almost exactly what a con artist wants to do. They want to give you exactly what you're expecting, luring you along, you know, and I, I'm not saying, by the way, that any of the companies that create these things are con artists or anything like that, but they have created a product, which in a way is by accident, sort of engineered to be as convincing as possible. Um, and you often need experts to look at the output and say, actually, that stuff is not correct. You know, if, if it cites sources that don't exist, we can all look those up. But if it says, okay, here's a mathematical explanation of X, you might need a mathematician to really see whether that's, whether that's right or not. So I would say don't be fooled by AI. Um, and also um, watch out for AI being used actually in the process of scamming and deception, right? So voice synthesis, uh, deep fakes, um, bots trying to talk you into things and so on. I mean, I think that's inevitably going to become more common and we're going to have to, uh, you know, work up our immunity to that and, and understand it better. But it's still going to use the same framework that we that we talked about because all of the scams have to sort of pry into our, our, our you know, cognitive weak points at some point. Yeah, the AI doomsayers, you know, when I push them for, well, exactly how is it that AI is going to kill every single person and living organism on Earth? The only scenario, well, nuclear war. Okay, so it seems to be something like, you know, an AI will create a deep fake video where uh, Putin uh, announcing that he's going to launch the missiles against the United States, and then Biden sees it and goes, oh, my God, we better do it. But surely there are checks and balances between that and actually pushing the button to launch your nuclear weapons. And the fact that we're all aware that chat GPT or these deep fakes could exist, we would have just more checks and balances in between. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure we yeah, I'm sure you could go back and forth with them on how these scenarios could work and, and so on. And I, I think it's good to think about them. I think it's odd that people are so convinced that this is bound to happen or it can never happen. Like we need to do a little bit of remaining uncertain <laughs> about these things and devoting some more resources to to figuring it out. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's like, uh, and people underestimate the power of government to control things and keep disasters from happening. My example is, you know, driving my Tesla. If I, if I p push the button and go navigate LAX and, it t and there's always traffic through LA. So it takes me up on the sidewalk and I, I mow down 20 p passengers. <laughs> How long will it be before the regulatory state jumps in and says, uh, Elon, <laughs> you're not going to sell these cars anymore until you fix this problem. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Well, there, and there's certainly ongoing disputes about how how safe is the so-called self-driving and and all that, and that that needs to that needs to happen. But you know, when from the point of view of from the point of view of deception, if you call something full self-driving mode, mm. if I've got a truth bias, I might think that means full self-driving mode. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Like I need to, you know, so that's that, that there, there, there you go. I, I do think we're a ways from this <laughs> happening as well as AI becoming sentient or anything like that. I, I just think this is a harder problem than anybody thinks it is. I'm sure this is a, a massive leap, but I've already seen stuff like this. Somebody uh, asked chatbot to explain something in economics and it cited some books that had never been written by economists oh, yeah, that don't course. exist. It's like, okay, why, wh how, why should we be afraid of this? What? <laughs> and, and in yeah. chess, it wasn't there something about none of these chatbots have any idea how chess is actually played. Yeah, they, they but but the funny thing is they will confidently spit out moves and ideas and so on, right? That because there's no often wrong but never in doubt is sort of the credo of 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 the of the chatbot. And I think it would be really nice research problem. Like even back with Watson, you know, which turned out not to be a very generalizable tool at all, they had a confidence level in the answers, and that's how they decided mm -hmm. whether to press the button and buzz in and risk being wrong. I think it would be a cool research direction if if um, if large language models would somehow build that in, like some kind of level of confidence in what they're outputting. And I don't know if that requires a minor tweak, the way some people would say, or whether it requires redesigning the entire approach. Um, those are interesting, you know. Th those are interesting questions. I think some that there is someone on Twitter that I read who was figuring out some really. There, there's a camp of people I think who believe that lurking inside the representations learned by all the hidden layers of large language models are super sophisticated, you know, uh, implementations of all kinds of concepts that we don't know are in there, but are in there somewhere. And I think there, there's some guy who's sort of devising very clever prompts to try to get chatbots to actually play chess coherently and so on. But I, I don't think it'll, I don't think it'll ever work except as them sort of playing a very intuitive game, perhaps where mm -hmm. they, you know, they, cause there's, there's no mechanism for, for doing search. Right. And even humans are doing search. We're searching ahead. We're saying if I go there and he goes there and then I go there and he goes there and, and so on. Like that's just not part of the architecture of a language model. <laughs> um, maybe a language model hybridized with some other kinds of things might be able to do it. But just all by itself, it's not obviously not, not there. Right. Yes. As, as I like to ask the AI people, does Watson even know, does it, does it know it beat the great Ken Jennings in Jeopardy? It's like, <laughs> doesn't even know it's playing Jeopardy. doesn't even know what that is. <laughs> yep. Same thing with Deep Blue. That's exactly what they said about Deep Blue. Does Deep Blue even know it beat Kasparov? And if not, how sad for Deep Blue to not know <laughs> that it right. beat Kasparov. You know? I know. That's too funny. Who's the greatest chess player of all time? Oh, well, I mean, there's two answers to that, right? One is Magnus Carlsen, who's the former world champion and still the highest rated human of all time. And then the other answer is probably Stockfish running on the fastest computer hardware <laughs> you can put it on because that's the best, that's the highest rated, you know, I computer see. program right now. So I, I did write a little column for the Wall Street Journal years ago about how the real world chess championship is happening in a computer in, in this apartment in Sweden where this guy would run a tournament every few months mm. between the, the best computer programs, and they're much better mm. than the humans who were playing the so-called World Chess Championship. Mm. The humans are always going to be more interested in what humans are doing than in what computers are doing, I think. I thought you were going to so say Bobby I, Fischer. I would say, oh, no, I, well, I, I can't say Bobby Fischer because although he was probably farther ahead of everybody else at the time, um, we understand chess so much better now than we did 50 years ago. Really? Even 50 years ago, Bobby Fischer had already re essentially retired. It was, you know, 51 years ago that he won the World Championship match. And it's just that the present day top players are better at chess than Bobby Fischer was. Um, he was better relative to his peers than they are relative to their peers, but on an absolute scale, they're better. It's, it's like people who run faster, right? Like the people of today run faster than the fastest people 50 years ago, even though the best runner 50 years ago might have been a, more faster than the second best runner than the top two guys are now. But what, I think of it on an absolute scale, just who makes the better moves. You know? Who was the guy you mentioned? Magnet, Magnum, Magnus, Magnus Carlson was the world champion that, for 10 I, years. And that's who I was this th year. thinking. Does he, is he autistic or something like that or no? My, I'm not as far as I know. I mean, I'm conflating ideas here. I yeah. I mean, there are lots of people, lot, I mean, there, there are people who like watch videos of people and so on and say, Oh, that person's autistic or whatever. But oh, I, I don't, see. I don't yeah. really believe in that kind of, that kind of diagnosis. I think also people have a bias to think that people who are good at chess are probably autistic, which <laughs> I don't know that <laughs> there's any actual data on that. I mean, it's like, the, probably the common, not. A common belief, but I don't think there's any any actual data. It's on. a little bit like but this it, this meme about madness and genius being so close, right? Yeah, <laughs> there's, exactly. an, there's anecdotes, but probably not a lot of data. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. All right, Christopher, thanks so much for for your book and your work, and and it's great. Yeah, we'll 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 provide a link to order the book and so on. Loved it. Okay. Really interesting material. Thanks again. Great. See you later.